Okay, uh, good afternoon, and actually good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'd like to welcome uh, all of our participants today to a webinar sponsored by the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office uh, on applying a lab safety culture to nanotechnology, educating the next generation of nanoscientists. And uh, my name is Chuck Geraci. I am your uh, moderator for today. And by way of, uh, of an introduction for myself, uh, I am the uh, Associate Director for Nanotechnology at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. I've been involved in various aspects of industrial hygiene for 40 years. Uh, that means I have some experience, but I'm also a little bit worn out at times. But I must say that this is an exciting topic. I'm pleased to provide overall guidance and direction to our nanotechnology research effort here at NIOSH. And I've been uh, pleased to be involved with uh, a number of the activities that, that are sponsored throughout the U.S. and throughout the world on nanotechnology. So today's webinar is, uh, is going to focus on uh, the activities associated with the Nano Environmental and Health Implications Working Group of the U.S. National Nanotechnology Initiative. And uh, we have quite a group uh, assembled today for this webinar, but I just want to mention that the, the NEHI Working Group is made up of 19 agencies uh, that all dedicate one part of their effort or another to the promotion of safe and responsible development of nanotechnology. And that is, in fact, uh, one of our national goals. Uh, safe and responsible development of the technology was a goal from the very beginning for the U.S. National Initiative. And what we want to do today is discuss how a good and effective culture of safety in the research laboratory can help facilitate good research in nanotechnology. And we're hoping that today we can build some awareness of the existing information resources that will help all of you. And we also want to engage both academia and industry in this discussion and share their practices, their perceptions, their expectations. And we also want to, to ensure that overall, both in academia and in the private sector, that a good culture of laboratory safety is, is a value in the work that you do. So as I stated, this is a priority for the National Nanotechnology Initiative. And we've had a growing number of questions put to us at workshops and at various uh, seminars and symposia about what should be done differently, if anything, in the laboratory community when dealing with nanomaterials and nanotechnology. And nanomaterials science presents to us a new challenge that in some instances we are creating novel, new to the world materials. And in other instances, we are now working with the nanoscale form or formula of what is a seemingly familiar material. So the question is, should these novel nanomaterials be treated differently? And are there anything and any special requirements for working with these new or novel materials different from any other new or novel chemical entity? And we also recognize that there's a diverse and exciting collection of various technical disciplines that go into this collection of practices we call nanotechnology. So what we want to do is balance good hazard information for what we do know about a growing number of nanomaterials to the huge number of nanomaterials that are engaged in research today. And we want to introduce nanomaterial science or nanotechnology into the general discussion of, of laboratory safety. So today we have a good panel of speakers uh, who will help us uh, understand and address uh, several of these topics in a, number, in a number of these areas. And so what I'd like to do today is get us started with some introductory remarks by Dr. Keith Watson. Um, Dr. Watson is Vice President for Core R&D at the Dow Chemical Company. He received his PhD from Northwestern University, and while there, he was there a joint student with uh, San Bin Nguyen and Chad Merkin, a name we're all familiar with in nanotechnology, before joining Dow Core R&D in 2001. And he's held a number of positions over the course of his career, but before moving into his current role, he was Global Director of R&D for Dow Coatings, Monomers, and Plastics. He also has a very unique uh, perspective in that he has a focus both on technology and business. Keith is a chartered financial analyst and he received his charter in 2011. 
So he's, in his words, even though he moved away from the bench, he is still a researcher at heart. And he recently chaired the Inorganic Gordon Conference. So I'd invite some remarks from Keith to get us started today. Safety is very important to me, to Dow Chemical, and to the entire chemical industry. Chemicals and materials provide many benefits, but they also carry risks. New fields of endeavor present many challenges, including the identification of hazards and risks. Nanotechnology is no different. It is exciting because new applications keep developing in medicine, materials, electronics, and in other fields. Recent events serve as a sobering reminder to us that chemistry can be dangerous. It is only through our vigilance that we can tame the dangers. We already have well-established and well-thought-out safety protocols in place across the industry. Lori Seiler of Dow Chemical is one of our speakers today. Lori does a great job of keeping us safe at Dow, but she has also been a force for change due to her efforts to share best practices with the entire industry. Lori was the driving force behind the creation of the Dow Safety Academy, a shining example of her commitment. At that website, you will find a wealth of information on how to safely handle chemicals in the laboratory setting. Thinking is the key. Engaging your mind before you start a task is the single biggest step in ensuring safety. I want to again thank the organizers, speakers, and all of you who are attending this for your commitment to safety. Keith, I want to thank you for that. Next uh, in our panel, I'd like to introduce uh, Larry Gibbs. He's Associate v Vice Provost for Environmental Health and Safety at Stanford University. And in that capacity, he directs their overall EHS and emergency management program and has oversight for the Stanford Nanofabrication Facility and the Stanford Nano Characterization Laboratory, as well as a variety of other duties and responsibilities. A focus of Larry's work is on identifying any of the unique characteristics and attributes affecting the advancement of laboratory safety culture in academic research labs. And I can say that any of us who have uh, studied up on how to drive and create, create and drive a good culture of safety in the laboratory will come across Larry's works in many places. So I'd like to invite Larry to offer some comments today. Thank you, Chuck, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone and welcome. Certainly, over the last eight years or so, everyone's aware of the different incidents that have occurred in laboratory safety, many of these high-profile, tragic, tragic, in some cases, high-consequence incidents. And although we know they're low probability, they can have catastrophic impact. The reviews that have occurred in all of these cite as a commonality lack of a strong safety culture as the major factor in many of these incidences especially in the academic research labs. There have been a number of publications by the high profile organizations from the Chemical Safety Board, American Chemical Society, the National Academies of Sciences, and most recently the American Public Land Grant Universities, all recommending the need for advancement of safety culture in academic research. And these have all have the common theme as well that there's a need here that we need to be focused on. Um, one of the things we often have to look at and talk about is the labor, what, what is it we mean by laboratory safety culture? And oftentimes when this was a started discussion many years ago, people said we need to create a new culture of safety. And the issue is everyone has a culture, not that we need to create a culture of safety. And it's a matter of trying to find out where you're at on this ladder or spectrum of culture as defined by Patrick Hudson. And figure out are there ways we can move beyond the lower rungs to the higher rungs. That's really the key here. It's a moving target, it continually changes, and as indicated on the slide, you have to really continue to focus on moving this forward because if you don't continue periodically focusing on it, the culture can move in both directions. It can also slip away. So that's really a key focus of moving the laboratory safety culture. What I want to focus on with the limited time I have this morning is just this also can be an ethical issue and should be viewed as an ethical issue in the nanotech lab or any laboratory. This is uh, some good work based by, on uh, the work of Robert McGinn, professor in management science and engineering at Stanford, who 
did a lot of work with the National Nanotechnology Infrastructure Network, a group of 13 uh, large research organizations focused on nanotechnology research. And um, there were really a core issue here is focusing on safety as a key ethical issue in the laboratory. And the reason for this is, how is this an issue of ethics? Well, safety is a critical re issue of ethics because without due regard to safety, there are any number of risks that can be uh, occurring or included in here. And you see those cited up here on the board. Um, from the fellow, impact of fellow researchers all the way down to potentially harming the future of nanotech research enterprise itself through the inappropriate or inadequate use of nanotechnology. The three major safety-related ethical responsibilities of nanotech uh, researchers in the labs is first, as mentioned, take suitable precautions, have a precautionary mindset. Second, avoid taking shortcuts. And this is what postured in the issue that it's ethically unacceptable to take shortcuts for any reason, but especially for personal convenience, time pressure, cost cutting, or looking at uh, uh, realizing research objective before a competitive does. And the last is supporting a strong lab safety culture. These are the critical elements. And in academic research, it should not be assumed that all researchers existing or new to the lab have the same level of understanding about what that responsibility in the lab requires of them. And that's really a key element and we'll talk about during the question period about why is this so important and different in an academic research lab? The second element is that the leader of individual laboratories have the strongest influence on lab safety culture, and it's their responsibility to create and sustain a lab safety culture. So in summary, you know, safety is a critical element in the responsible conduct of research. I think that's through throughout all of the land. And what's that reason? One is we're educating the next generation of thought leaders, and we need to impart and develop skill sets that go along with doing excellent science. For faculty, a robust safety culture keeps incidents minor. They, the incidents may occur, but you've been adequately prepared for them. And the third, not having a strong safety culture can lead to catastrophic events as we've seen at other institutions. So just wanna leave with one final thought, and that's Managing the Unexpected, which is a really good book to look at. And what's not pervasive are well-developed skill sets to detect and contain errors. Everything else on the negative side can become pervasive. So I want to stop there and reinforce, this is what our Lab Safety Culture Task Force identified, that the leader of the lab is the single most important element for sustaining a strong, positive lab safety culture. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And uh, our, our next panelist uh, to present thoughts and ideas today is uh, Dr. Craig Merlick. He's Associate Professor of Chemistry and Executive Director of the UCLA Center for Laboratory Safety. Uh, Craig's very active in promoting safety at UCLA and throughout the University of California system. And he serves as Chair of the Department uh, as, of Chemistry and Biochemistry Safety Committee and the Campus-Wide Chemical and Physical Safety Committee, and also the ULA, UCLA uh, Safety Oversight Committee. Um, the safety um, uh, overall has become a very important element in, in the planning and the, and the delivery of research in our academic laboratories. And I know Craig has been very involved in helping to drive the, uh, the, the resources and the culture for that overall effort within the, the system. And as we have seen with Larry and his participation, you'll see Craig uh, in a variety of, of, of roles as it relates to the creation and the driving of a good culture of laboratory safety. So we'll invite uh, Craig to offer some thoughts today on, on the uh, academic side of driving a good culture of safety in our laboratories. Thank you very much, Chuck. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the presentation today and um, hope you get a lot of good uh, information about how we can improve safety in the nanotechnology area. So I'd like to start off um, talking about the spectrum of nanotechnology hazards. And so on this slide here, we can see that there are um, health and environmental hazards as well as research hazards. But much has been said about the health effects and environmental potential effects of nanotechnology and new nanomaterials. 
So as a researcher myself, I'd like to just focus in on some of the research hazards. And what I've seen here at UCLA and in uh, other institutions is the exceptionally broad range of chemical and physical hazards that are present in the research enterprise for nanotechnology. Um, the synthesis of new materials has essentially taken every possible technique and applied it to uh, pr provide new materials. And so for the researchers, this presents a challenge in that they have to have a very broad training in uh, laboratory hazards to address these actions. And so in the synthesis of new materials, there's going to be the synthesis and then the modification of nanomaterials, processing, characterization, and testing. Um, and at every level, the researchers need to uh, address the hazards. And so this broad knowledge is, is quite a challenge. And so it often stretches the limits of in-house safety personnel. So speaking from an academic institution, I can say that our EHNS has uh, good expertise, but oftentimes it's not possible for them to, to know the full spectrum of hazards within it, as individual labs. So that calls into uh, the need for researchers to have broad training. So on the next slide here, I sort of at the top show the A to Z elements of a good safety program. And so all these different local and local layers of risk management apply, starting from the administrative commitment. Back one. Where to go? This slide. Okay, the list here showing administrative commitment all the way through hazard identification and risk assessment and also risk mitigation. So these are all the, the usual uh, factors that must be considered. But really, a strong safety culture can come into play here because um, there are the, the potential gaps in the institutional support for safety. So it's really the bench scientists that are going to be leading the safety practices rather than merely following the regulations. And so <clears throat> that calls into the need for a, a thorough training of the research scientists working in nanotechnology. So um, one note here is the safety culture approach is that a really beneficial consequence of this is that we can view compliance with regulatory regu requirements as an outcome of a strong safety culture. Usually, in, in many labs, they are concerned about compliance with regulatory requirements, and that might be a goal. But really, if the goal is to have a strong safety culture, then compliance can actually be an outcome of that and rather than a leading goal. So one thing I'd like to show here on this slide is the safety triad. And this is one way of looking at safety actions within the institution. And so we see that there are safety programs. And safety programs include all, include all the activities by h and s and lessons learned and SOPs and PPP, PPE usage, et cetera. Um, and then today, we're going to be talking a lot about safety culture. And safety culture can be viewed as the institution's complete set of safety policies and procedures and the institution's commitment to them. But really, what we also want to look at in terms of safety is the uh, safety outcomes. The safety outcomes are what incidents occur, where they occur, how they occur, um, and how often they occur, and why they occur. And so looking at all three areas is, is critically important. So on the next slide, I give some uh, bad results. And so it's been mentioned in the national press some high-profile incidents. But I list here some ones that didn't make the national press. And some of these occurred in materials science laboratories. Um, and it shows that there's a, a need for greater attention to specific uh, areas of, of analysis for hazard assessments and to avoid catastrophic uh, problems like this. So there's a need, a better, more, more attention needs to be paid to uh, evaluating physical hazards, uh, controlling scale of experiments, and uh, the identification of different types of hazards and how to mitigate those hazards. And all of these could benefit from a more robust training of our students in a stronger safety culture. And then here, I just want to show a slide that um, I'll mention later in the, in the question Q&A part. And that is that we've, at the UC Center for Laboratory Safety, have studied the effect of PI engagement on injuries. 
And if you just look at the left side and the, the blue bar is when the mon PI monitors laboratory safety, there's uh, very few major injuries. But if you look at the green bars in the left graph, um, when the PI is not involved in the safety, then it, the lab is more likely to have uh, injuries. So here we have a, an indicator of um, injuries and how this ties into PI engagement and, and safety. So I'd like to close off there with three key things. One, there's no magic bullet. But we have to have a sustained and comprehensive approach. Uh, two, that we have to have um, engagement by the PI to prevent injuries. And then the last component is that uh, safety accidents really are key to um, calling into question certain practices and, and designing and addressing training programs to prevent accidents. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Craig. And um, what I'd like to do is uh, next invite our, our final panelist, uh, Lori Seiler. Uh, Lori is Associate Director for Global R&D EH&S at the Dow Chemical Company. Um, she has responsibility, she actually provides leadership and has responsibility for the Global R&D EHS and Research Sample Management and the R&D Mechanical Integrity. It's uh, quite a role that Lori has at Dow. And she has responsibility for supporting the delivery of these EHS capability solutions across innovation, which includes compliance and exceptional safety performance for their global R&D community. And any of us who have uh, cruised through any of the resources and websites available on laboratory safety will certainly come across Dow Chemical and the Dow uh, Safety Academy. So I'll invite Lori to uh, provide for us uh, perspective. And, and we're very deliberate about, uh, and we're very happy to have Lori participate today. And we were very deliberate about having uh, someone who could represent and discuss with us the experience out in the private sector. So Lori, we'd appreciate your comments. Great, uh, Chuck. Thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be with everyone here today. The, uh, as my other panelists have talked about, there is so much that needs to be done with respect to building and sustaining a strong safety culture. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight were just a few key examples of our approach that has been working for us within Dow. Um, as you look at the slide here, we, I've got information about management systems and metrics and so on, but really it does start at the top. And so uh, even at our CEO level, the mantra is safety above all else. And so being able to have that start at the very beginning and with every leader, it's important that that influence then frames how we carry out our daily work in the research environment in particular, as well as all the other broad aspects of, of the Dow Chemical Company. And as you can imagine, we are, we're here focused today talking about research laboratories, but we're talking about uh, large-scale manufacturing, folks who are on the uh, sales calls, doesn't matter which part of the company you're in, safety above all else as you execute your work is an expectation. So to help build some of that, though, as, as my previous panelists talked about, it's about moving away from just compliance but moving into commitment. So we've really tried to blend the into our EHS systems and metrics that we track to incorporate what might be needed from a compliance perspective, but really build in the hazard awareness and teaching moments into all of the systems that we apply. And in order to have that work successfully, though, it really does need to be uh, leader-driven. And so uh, that is a key part of, of what we talk about. And it, it does take people at every single level in the company in order to achieve that success. And the other thing that we've learned, particularly as someone who's worked in supporting the research environment for a long time, we all know that one size does not fit all. And so many of our systems and things that may have been initially created for a manufacturing type environment, we do spend time within the R&D EHS team looking at tailoring that for application at the bench scale. So that's been a key part of what we've been able to do to make sure that the right hazards are being evaluated at the right level. So as we move into that, though, as we look at some of the elements, what I would consider of a sustainable lab safety culture, it's ultimately around making sure that it's, it is a continuous spectrum. And it's important that the uh, elements of leaders have to be engaged, 
Uh, and it's about being visible in the field, talking with their folks, having that, just even having that offline conversation of how was the weekend, engaging with people to get to know folks, and then to really have that open dialogue around what safety considerations are people taking with respect to their work, and making sure that things are being followed. Hazard awareness is a perfect example of the things that we need to continue to do. As we move into new technology, we're going to be challenged with trying to uh, learn as we go with some of these new hazards, and it's important that we apply the key principles from our past for success, but also keep an eye towards what we might need to do differently going forward and really being pulling together the various groups that work well together in order to come up with a collaborative solution. So sharing of events, sharing near misses, communicating when events happen, even if it's within the department, across departments, across the entire company. Those are things that we do on an ongoing basis in order to make sure that we learn from any of our events that do occur so that we can build into our management systems and so on uh, the, the things that we need to do. So with that said, it really does take uh, the systems, leadership commitment, but also individual commitment. So we need our, our employees and our contractors that work in our facilities to be able to participate in the process. We have plenty of opportunities where people get a chance to do that, whether it's setting individual safety goals uh, for every year that's part of the performance management process, all the way to really driving initiatives to help in, enhance safety culture within the work groups. Everyone has a different role that they play, and by being able to have that collaborative approach, we're building in the use of the subject matter experts from our environmental health and safety teams, like industrial hygiene, safety, process safety, reactive chem, side by side with our scientists in order to come up with what will be the appropriate protocols and uh, best practices. So uh, to, to close out in our last piece here, uh, one of the things that, and folks had mentioned this earlier, is sharing of best practices is a key part of what we do. And so uh, some of you may have seen the Dow Lab Safety Academy. This is some, uh, an initiative we launched several years ago to be able to help share some of the things that are working at, well at Dow to be able to share with others so that they can be things that you can adapt uh, for your own use and make sure that we're continuing to share best practices with each other because that's a key part of, the, uh, of safety is that it does all of us want to work safe, have a a uh, long productive career and not being injured in any way, and we don't want any of our lab mates to be hurt. So this is a way to make sure that we're continuing to share that knowledge so that we can con uh, continue to have the great science. So with that, I'll, I'll close. Thank you, Lori. And, and now I'd like to move into some questions that I have for our panelists, uh, and we will also be moving to questions that we have from, from our um, participants logged in from around the world. And a question that I think many of us uh, get all the time, and I'd like to get some thoughts uh, from our panelists is, uh, you know, just how does an organization build good safety awareness and the skills needed to support it? And how might that differ as you go from the environment and ac academia to the environment in the private sector. And so I'll, I'll invite Larry and, and Lori and in no preferred order to, to provide some, uh, some thoughts, some ideas on just that fairly basic question of just how do you build that safety awareness? What kind of skills are needed to do that? Well, uh, this is Larry, I'll, I'll start if I may. Um, I think one of the critical elements is really understanding the organizations that you work with. Uh, one of the things that's unique and challenging with academic research organizations and the environment is that it's often like working with seven to 800 independent small business owners, all working to gain research funding, sustain that funding, et cetera, and trying to coordinate that at the same time. I think that's a, a significant organizational hierarchy difference between academic research and, and uh, industrial or, or private sector research. 
The second major organizational differential is researchers themselves. The majority of our researchers are graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. They're young, often this is their first time working at the research bench, and they often work quite independent of others. Um, Enterprise-wide, we have approximately a 20% turnover per year of our total researcher group, so that leads to its own challenges. And the what we found, as I mentioned in the presentation, is that the leader of the individual research laboratories, at least in an academic research setting, have the most direct and lasting impact on researchers that are new to the lab. So that safety culture certainly can be supported from the top down, but it's really driven from the bottom up, and I think that's the challenge we have. Um, and to exacerbate that challenge, what's happened and certainly Craig and others can talk to this, uh, the time spent actually on research by the faculty and principal investigators involved with research has been diminished due to the driving of administrative requirements for uh, research leaders and faculty leading large research programs. And those are all factors that have to come into this. Now, how, how can we build that? And my, belief is that we really have to start with a really critical triangle of the research group leader, which is the faculty or PI, those people in the lab, and I think uh, the environmental health and safety programs of the respective organization have a critical role and develop more of a collaboration around that triangle. I think it's a, a changing culture is not a short-term outcome. It's a long-term goal and it's a long-term outcome. So the focus, focus on research is at many levels. It's, it's a budding researcher. We need better skill development in hazard assessment, safety risk assessment, or the experimental project planning. And that should be a part of that normal mentoring and advising that takes place in the research lab. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there to give Lori a chance to weigh in. But those are some of the challenges, and I can talk more about how that is trying and in other areas being approached. Yeah, I, I think the um, a build that I would add here is when we look at our holding our PIs and our leaders accountable for safety, one of the things that is key to that success is making sure that they've had the development to really understand what it is that they need to do in order to build a strong safety culture within their environment and knowing that they really should feel empowered to uh, tailor things for what they need to do. The, the collaboration that was mentioned with engagement with the environmental health and safety offices from the various universities and institutions is, is crucial because being able to, by partnering together, you'd be able to build the right type of modules and uh, provide the right type of support for leaders in order to be able to execute that aspect of their job. It, it's, uh, uh, and I'm sure for those of you who have ever had to experience as a leader, uh, talking with a family member about uh, someone in your laboratory that got hurt, no one really prepares you for that type of conversation, and it's something that we don't ever really want to have to relive. And so there are ways that we really, I think, truly need to be able to help our leaders understand the magnitude of responsibility that they have, because they do set the tone, and as was also said, the idea that it has to be engagement across all levels and roles and really that um, cross-functional approach is going to be key to, to building something that's uh, positive and sustainable. This is Craig, and I'll jump in with a few comments here, also speaking from an academic perspective. And I think one thing that's really interesting is the uh, difference in uh, autonomy between academics and industry. In industry, there's oftentimes a, a well-organized management structure but in academic research, oftentimes the PI, the professor, has an amazing autonomy. It's possible to be a professor working on a project and go for years without ever actually talking to the dean or the vice chancellor for research or any of the other people higher up in the administration because the PI has so much autonomy. So it's important for each and S to recognize that and support every single PI in terms, uh, in terms of developing this strong safety culture. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's that, that autonomy that creates a challenge for academics uh, in terms of communicating down to everyone uh, 
uh, the, the need for high level of safety culture. Okay. Well, thank everybody for those comments, and that plays into uh, another question that we have. And we'll we'll use we'll get one final question to the panelists, and we'll go to questions uh, from our attendees. And some of this has been answered in some of our comments already, but it comes up quite a bit. And who do we feel has the ultimate responsibility for creating and delivering that environment or that culture of safety in the research laboratory? And is it different at different levels for different types of work? So I'll open that up to our panelists. And uh, maybe, uh, Craig, you kind of hit on that already about the autonomy of the PI. And so maybe that would be a good point, a good place to start with. Who has ultimate responsibility for this? Te technically, the chancellor or president of the university will have ultimate uh, responsibility. But I, I guess I would challenge the question and say that really it's everyone's responsibility to create and, and maintain the environment of safety. Um, it, it can't just be the Chancellor University and it can't just be the faculty. I think one of the things that's, that's so critical as a recommendation to EHS is that um, EHS must be incredibly thorough in, in their work, but they also have to be incredibly collaborative with the faculty. Um, the faculty are experts in nanotechnology and other areas of science, um, and they're not experts in safety. And so what needs to be done is the, the EHS needs to have programs that they can support and collaborate with the faculty on safety programs. And then as I mentioned in my talk part, the PI engagement is, is such a critical driver of safety. When the PI is actively engaged in promoting safety within their research group, um, it really has a dramatic impact on reducing incidents and accidents and injuries. So um, the h and professionals need to do everything they can to engage and support faculty uh, in promoting safety within their research groups. Yeah, this is uh, Larry. I'd like to follow on a little bit. And I, I'd actually alter the question a little and say, who ultimately has the greatest influence on creating and delivering an environment of safety in the research laboratory? Because I think that's really what we're getting at, the positive do. Where is that, where is the most influencing area and I think that rests in the lab itself with the leadership of that individual lab. There are supports that are needed from outside the organization to help make that happen. But the single most important individual is the principal investigator, the faculty member operating that lab. And I think our job is to help support that to happen. Uh, the second part of that, because every, everyone in that lab from a science perspective, research perspective, they take the lead from that individual. And the influence of that can't be overstated. I think um, you know, it's been identified in many reviews and others, the, the power influence of the role of the principal investigator is great. Oftentimes not always recognized that that power differential in the lab, uh, whether it's acknowledged or not, is always there. Because that uh, influence over the researchers, most of whom are graduate students or even postdoctoral fellows, exists. And, and that needs to be used in a number of ways to help advance the safety culture and the mentoring that takes place in the lab and the advising that takes place in the lab, not only for science, but how to do science responsibly and safely. And I think that's really one of the key elements. The institution, EHS and other elements, need to have systems in, supply, in place to help support that. But that's, um, at least from my perspective, I think that's where the greatest influence comes from that individual. The second part of that is that when you look at the turnover in laboratories in academia, about every five years, you, most laboratories have about an 80% turnover in the researchers in the lab. They're graduate students, postdoctoral fellows. And so that changeover is constant. What the, the one single consistency, however, throughout that time is the faculty member of the PI. And so it's really important that a position for developing and sustaining the safety culture. If, if I could just add to that, I, I think the, a key part of it as well is the idea that with all the systems, et cetera, that may be already available, it's ultimately the, in this case, the PI or the work group leader 
setting their expectations for how work will be conducted safely in their, in their laboratories, and then following through, whether it's through direct intervention on their own or by identifying a uh, laboratory manager or other, other um, structure to, to be able to ensure that the expectations are being followed through upon is a key part of it. Because we know, as we were saying earlier, folks can't be all places at all times. So there does need to be a, a group sense of what the accountability is within the whole team in order to make sure that we're holding each other accountable as well. But the tone still, those expectations, and as my fellow panelists have said, still need to be uh, established at the leadership level. But being able to, you know, so for instance, is there an intervention culture? So if you, if you see a, a lab colleague not wearing their proper protective equipment or they're a, appearing to do something, an unsafe act, do the fellow lab mates feel like the culture is strong enough that they can intervene on that person's safety and be able to help coach and provide the, the, the uh, best advice on how to not be injured as a result of what they're doing. That's a, a key element of that culture that needs to be prevalent as well. Well, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Lori and Craig and, and, and Larry for, for, for the great uh, discussion and the great dialogue on this. What I'd, I'd like to do is, is take questions from, from our audience and have our panelists respond to those questions. And so we have a number, number of questions that have been offered to us, actually a large number of questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can in this segment, and we may come up with a process to try to respond to as many of these as we can even after the webinar. But one of the questions was, what nanomaterials currently have required or recommended occupational exposure limits uh, developed for them, and what are the respective references? Um, I'll, I'll take a, the first stab at that, uh, at that question, and that is, it depends on what country you live in. So I'll, I'll be very US-centric about that and say that in the United States, um, NIOSH has been developing recommended exposure limits and looking at risk uh, assessment uh, assessments for engineered nanomaterials for a while now. And we've published uh, two current intelligence bulletins, current intelligence bulletin 65, occupational exposure to carbon nanotubes and nanofibers, and current intelligence bulletin 63, uh, occupational exposure to titanium dioxide. Those are available on the NIOSH website. And some of you may be aware of our recent efforts to evaluate occupational exposure to engineered uh, silver nanomaterials or silver nanomaterials. And that is currently in review stage and uh, will be published sometime within the next year, depending on the level of comment and time necessary to do that. Uh, you'll find information uh, and resource for this on a, on a resource web page. We'll show you in a little bit about how you could link out to all the different guidance from, from around uh, the U.S. and around uh, the, the rest of the world. So do you have any uh, additional comments from any of our other panelists? Okay, we've got a, uh, another question that... Um, is there a sampling media and equipment that rec it recognized as supporting consistent sampling and analytical results? And, and one of the things I'll state is, and that goes into another question, that uh, is there a compendium of those published methods and availabilities? Uh, a variety of organizations have published their approach to evaluating engineered nanomaterial exposure in the workplace and in the environment. And uh, I'll, I'll point to um, the NIOSH website for some of those resources the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD website for a number of those res uh, resources and strategies and methodologies. And many um, um, individual research studies have been published in a variety of journals about how to go about evaluating workplace exposure to engineered nanomaterials. Uh, several courses are being offered on that. There is a course on that topic coming up at the Industrial Hygiene Conference. Uh, that information on that is available on the conference website. And uh, NIOSH just recently published a summary of the strategy that is used for field investigations for uh, ex evaluating exposure to engineered nanomaterials. So there's a variety of resources available for any of you to, to pick and choose from as you put together your thoughts on how one might go about evaluating exposure. Um, 
a, another question that was put to us deals with um, how do you how do you address how do you deal with uh, the gap between industrial safety culture, academic safety culture, and does regulatory compliance have have a role in that? And how does one address regulatory compliance as a supporting feature or a driver for a safety culture in academia versus industry? And I'll turn this over to to our panelists. Well, this is Larry. I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Um, certainly, compliance is a core element of any program in any organization, and you need to have that uh, element present. Uh, as Craig alluded to in his discussion, if you have a robust safety culture, compliance will be a part of that. And in fact, it will be seen more as a part of doing business, you know, as a good safety performance indicator. Um, so I don't see that them as certainly being uh, intention. Uh, I think what you can do, however, if you have a robust safety culture or a strong safety culture, that compliance as an element of that, but it's not necessarily the overall driver. The driver becomes uh, looking at people's safety around you, et cetera, and in doing so, you'll see that compliance falls into line for a good percentage of it. There are administrative elements to compliance that don't necessarily have the direct link or is not necessarily seen at the level of the lab, but are requirements that have been put on by the regulatory agencies where we have to adapt certain regulations to fit a non-intended um, non area, which often happens in research laboratories where outside regulations have to be made to fit that laboratory. Now, I don't think they're incompatible at all, and I think they, they are can be complementary. Yeah, as, this is Lori. I, I would I would add to that that realistically, I think as what Larry stated, if many times the compliance aspect of an activity, it can, if that's blended in as part of an existing system that's driving uh, more hazard awareness understanding, it's almost seamless uh, as to what what the compliance piece of it is. But is if we're only striving for compliance we're missing plenty of opportunity in order to really drive the idea of making sure that safe work practices are part of everybody's work every day. And in fact, I know if we flip it the other way, if we say we're only focusing on things that are regulatory and in nature, um, I, we, there's only a there is a, uh, as I say this, there is a limited amount of um, regulations that cover some of the work that we do, even though that does seem onerous at times that there are many, but we don't have everything regulated and we don't really want to move to that space. So if we, uh, our regulatory agencies have covered the items that feel have the greatest impact, but beyond that, it's really about how to effectively apply those principles into the new environments that we're, our researchers are trying to move into every day. So we don't want to forget the why we're doing the things that we do, even if they may have a regulatory basis. I also agree with my compliance that, like my colleagues, that compliance is very important. Um, but it's also important to recognize the limitations of merely just looking at compliance. If you consider an overlap between compliance and actual safety, um, there's not necessarily a perfect overlap of those two areas. And so, that's critically important that we be compliant, but that we move beyond that. Um, for many researchers, and myself speaking as a researcher, I'm most interest, interested in the safety of my graduate students and postdocs, um, and certainly I, I want to be compliant for the h &S inspectors when they come, but for my students, I want, I want them to be in a safe lab environment. And so one thing to note is that the lab standard, so the lab standard from OSHA in 1990, 26 years ago, was largely felt focused on health effects um, and largely ignored physical and chem uh, physical and environmental hazards. And so, and if we, if we consider the type of accidents that have either uh, been in, written up in the national press or the ones that I had in my slide earlier today, um, my, many of the accidents that have, that have occurred recently have been due to um, process and physical issues and not health effects that were sort of addressed 
principally about a laboratory standard. So I think it's critically important that we have a robust safety culture within each of the labs and move well beyond the mere regulatory compliance and meeting those standards. Okay, we have another question that deals with uh, what kind of uh, examples can we point to or can we discuss uh, that require or call for adjustments in either task performance or work practices or protective equipment or controls when one is working with engineered nanomaterial and there are any possible particulate generating processes involved and what are the challenges with that? And one of the things I'll mention is that we had a, have a challenge with nanoscience right now that uh, deals with um, working with seemingly familiar materi materials, but now in a different scale and having different chemical and physical properties that in itself uh, represents a rethinking of some of the hazard analysis that's been performed and the types of containment and control and protective equipment possibilities in the lab uh, need to be evaluated when one moves to those uh, nanomaterials, if they are handled in a dry powder form, tend to be fairly low density, therefore somewhat buoyant, and may require a different uh, way of containing and controlling them. The other part, the other thing that I'd like to mention, and I'll get our panelists' comments on this, is in a discovery environment, very often the materials, the processes, the high energy systems that bring you to your novel material are high hazard and, 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 and high risk systems as well. And so that needs to be factored into the overall picture of how one does nanoscale science and engineering research. So the question was very specific to engineering controls and PPE, and do you need to do something different because you've now moved into the nano scale? I'll, I'll invite comments from our, our uh, panelists on that. Uh, this is Larry. I'll comment. Um, I think one of the things, especially in higher ed, where we work with such a diverse spectrum of uh, scientific research, we have to take the learnings that we can gain from other applications. For example, our um, uh, virologists and others have been working with nano-sized materials for years. They're called viruses. And so the engineering controls that were developed to capture those, much of that technology works very well for nano-sized uh, engineered nano nanoparticles as well. And so, and, and also the approach to the controls using a, it, well, is essentially a control banding approach for microbiological materials is something that's being well, uh, more well developed and, and validated through work at NIOSH and other places. So uh, we may not know specifically some of the hazardous properties, but we can develop engineering controls to uh, work with them safely until those properties become more well established. And so learning from what's been done in other scientific areas is very important. I'll second Chuck's uh, issue uh, that he raised regarding the tools of, of nanotechnology, however, because the use of many of these tools, whether it's highly toxic gases, particular different types of uh, mechanical devices, et cetera, that may have intrinsic hazards themselves is one of the things that we have to be aware of uh, especially with nanomaterial moving beyond the material scientists and chemists realm. We now have a lot of uh, overlap where we're looking at um, molecular scientists and biologists and medical researchers starting to work in the development of, of nano-sized materials and nanoparticles and nano-engineered materials. And so these uh, individuals may not be as first with the use of the higher hazard tools that are used for working with the, these materials. And, so that's a cross learning that we're trying to figure out how best to impart the skills that are needed for that type of work. It's still a challenge, but we continue to work on it. And I'd like to address one part of the question related to PPE control. And each institution has PPE requirements and certainly a lab code is one of the most basic in that area. Um, but it's interesting that lab codes actually provide very poor protection overall because the, the standard cotton lab coat, while it's breathable and, and comfortable, is actually very porous and permeable. It's also very uh, wicking of, of chemicals. And it's also reactive with, with chemicals. And so that the standard white cotton lab coat is, is not adequate. And then we now have FR lab coats, and they have uh, flame-resistant properties, but they actually still fail um, regarding 
the permeability and wicking and, and reactivity with the chemicals that are used to process nanoparticles. So just in the last uh, couple of months, and a new lab code has come out, and I don't want to necessarily promote a particular company, but I just want to uh, promote this new technology that's coming out, that they have lab coats that are comfortable and breathable, but they actually are, are non-wicking uh, and, and non-reactive with many chemicals. And so I, I think there's just an incredible advance now on, on lab coat technology that's going to provide a greater level of safety for lab workers. Okay, and Craig, I want to thank you for that. And, I, and being mindful of our time, I want to note that we had a large number of questions, and we'll, we'll address those in the best way that we can and post them on the, uh, the nano.gov website, the webcast at, at nnco.nano.gov, and we'll see uh, how, how quickly we can, can address that. But I want to get to, to some uh, closing comments here that uh, on the nano.gov website, um, the NNCO has... Uh, the, the NNCO has collected a variety of resources and posted them on nano.gov slash lab safety. We invite you to visit that website and see the resources that are available. We also invite you to make suggestions to the NNCO of additional resources or websites that you feel would be helpful in this overall effort uh, to promote a good culture of safety in our laboratories. And so we, we certainly invite our, our, our audience to, to visit that web page. And then I also want to point out that from uh, the various government uh, agencies who participate in the NNI, uh, a lot of good guidance is being issued uh, by those agencies. And I hold up here examples of, of documents from NIOSH and OSHA, very specific to engineered nanomaterials, either, either recommended exposure limits or practices and technologies for good, safe handling and containment and control uh, of, of engineered nanomaterials within a variety of environments, including the, the, the research laboratory. Um, so with that, I'd want to thank all of you who joined us today. Uh, I'd like to remind you that this webinar will be archived on the nnco.nano.gov website at the webcast. And so I want to certainly thank all of our panelists today and all of you from around the world who logged in uh, to participate in this webinar. Thank you all so very much. <laughs>